partidei Delgado, acolo este o batit corner, dragi ascultători. De... Are you ready, sir? Yeah. Yeah, all right, grand. Okay, here we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Broken Leg Review. I'm Richard Jackson, and uh, I'm joined today by a very special guest, uh, all the way from that America to this America, Valverde. It's TGV from the Urban Gentry, normally in the world of watches and, yes. and finery. Yeah. You're like the anti-Jackson. I'm, I'm here in my Primark uh, tracky <laughs> bottoms. You're looking very refined. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Honour to be here. Thank you so much oh, for having me. Our pleasure, man. Absolutely. So we, we're going to talk about something that I've wanted to talk about for a while, and I didn't ever conceive it would be with yourself. Okay. Um, so that, that's a nice, nice thing. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about Craig Zahler's 2014 Western horror thing, Bone yeah. Tomahawk. Yeah. It's such mm. a cool movie. It is a cool movie. It's. I. I, th I mean, the thing. The things to discuss before we get into it really. Yeah. Are, this came from kind of nowhere. Um, Craig Zahler, I think, was I think in his forties already when he did this. He's uh, he was in like death metal bands. Right. It's a composer. It's a novelist, and I think his novels are what brought him to the attention of Kurt Russell, for example. Really? So this, I think, what I find interesting about this is it's a debut feature. It's probably the strongest debut you can imagine. He yeah. he's Rickmaned it right because he's right. sort of that point in life. Um, it just feels so fully formed and accomplished as a piece. Yeah, yeah, you know? it's, like, it's a film you'd expect somebody that's been making films for a long time to, Yeah. You know, um, it, it was obviously it's his debut, but have you seen his, his other work? Yeah, so I've seen um, Riot in Cell Block 99. Right. I should probably say that properly. Riot in Cell Block 99. Right. That just fell out of my mouth, didn't it? <laughs> um, Riot in Cell Block 99 with Vince Vaughan and Don Johnson. Um, it was interesting. Uh -huh. Personally, I don't like it as much as this. Right. It didn't feel like it has much of a point. It's a similar thing. It's got that kind of stillness and brutality because this film takes its time. Yeah. And I'm often one to bitch about run times, yeah. but I feel like if you're using it's it right. It's 132 minutes and it's, I think it's, oh, I, I personally was with it the whole way. I never looked at the wa my watch. Oh, nice time there. Um, <laughs> but no, seriously, I, I, I was captivated from start to finish. Mm, it is a really, it's kind of spellbinding. I mean, mm. it's also fucking horrible. Yeah. Because I make it sound like Mary Poppins. Like, yeah. oh, I was spellbound, but like, it's it's horrible. Yeah. It's really horrible. And, and um, the new one, his new one is with Mel Gibson and Vince Vaughn. That's called Drag Cross Concrete. Mm. And I think everyone's that, just expecting. That sounds even more horrible. Even more, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, the <laughs> my friends uh, told me about a, a big, I need to give a shout out to Alex Ewing he's been on my case to do Ace Craig Zahler stuff for fucking ages. So right. here, here you are, mate, it's happening. Um, my friend Tom, though, Alex hooked me up with um, Subway 99. And Tom said, if there was one word to sum up the last act of Cell Block 99, it would be upsetting. Upsetting, <laughs> right. That's kind of the final act of this. Yeah. It's upsetting. Yeah. It's just like, oh, this is completely horrible, yeah. but I'm kind of enjoying it. And Strange, yeah. Yeah. But I've got to say, um, off the bat, it starts in such a horrific way as well, because mm. it, you, it opens with, I think, David Arquette's character and the guy from... Um, the Rob Zombie horror films. Oh yeah, Sid Haig. I do, yeah, yeah. Sid yeah, Haig, yeah. Uh, it starts with a, him trying to, very, in a very clumsy way, slit someone's throat. And it's so awkward. <sighs> and and from, the, from the first you know, opening of the film, it kind of, it's, I think it's clever because it, it, it's, it tells the viewer that, you know, you're, you're gonna, this is what you're in for. It's a statement of intent, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And actually what you're in for is a ton worse. Mm. Um, I, I think, when you put Sid Haig in stuff. Mm. So Sid Haig uh, was someone who worked with Roger Corman and Andy Sidaris. Right. So he was kind of your, your B-movie guy. Yeah. So when Rob Zombie cast him. Was he in a lot of the blacks? Uh, yeah, he was, yeah, yeah he was. Right. So I can't remember which ones, he did some Pam Greer ones and stuff. So when you put Sid Haig in a thing, it's one of those statement casts, right. what you're saying. I didn't realise that. That's yeah, really so Cell Block 99, it, it does loads and loads of grindhouse-y stuff. Right. And the premise of this, and the last act is very grindhousey, mm. but up until then, it's kind of a conventional western. Yeah. It's only when it jumps off that cliff at the yeah. end, and it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is but really I, I think also, it, it, it kind of 
tells the viewer that this is not going to be a spaghetti, operatic, you know, romantic. Because when we think of Western, I think of uh, Sergio Leone. Of course, yeah, of course. And, you know, this, uh, to me, they're very escapist and romantic, even though it's the frontier, which doesn't, you know. Mm, but, mm. but that's, I think, that's an Italian. Well, it, it's, that's an interesting thing as well, isn't it? Because like, Westerns are very much about creating the American myth. Because yeah. in such a kind of young culture right. you create your own myth mythology and when they were making the first western movies in the silent era mm. they had people in them that were from the west yeah. you know and the people actually lived it and stuff um and and you know then you had the version through the italian lens of course which is mm. a whole other thing which mm. sort of takes it into europe and looks at it from that angle mm. and this is you know yeah, kind of 21st century yeah. thing. Because a lot of modern Westerns, like True, the remake of True Grit and um, Three Sense of Humor and stuff, still mm. have that kind of slightly operatic thing. Yeah. This doesn't. I mean, it's minimal. Like, yeah, and, and the score is minimal Yeah. as well. I mean, there's hardly, I, I can't even remember. There's like few moments. Yeah, you're not going to whistle any of it. No, you exactly, know? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it's... You're talking in whistles. Oh, you? God. Yeah. Yeah, that's such an odd. Uh, we are. We just. It's just presu presumption of spoilers on this show. So oh, okay. um, yeah. Okay. So don't worry about that. So yeah, the kind of tribe have had their sort of throats replaced yeah, with it's a bit wrapped to Jurassic bone whistle. Well, that's the thing because it's so minimal and it's so considered. And when I say minimal, I'm talking about because like you know, films can be boring when they're too long and or too packed or too kind of messy. There's a bit where there's. Um, I think it's. Patrick Wilson's character after his wife has disappeared, it's a shot inside their bedroom of him looking for her. Mm. And I seem to remember the camera just kind of really slowly pans across a dresser. Mm. And it's really slow and really small movement. But I was kind of like, oh, I really enjoyed that prolonged shot of a dresser. Yeah. <laughs> it was part of the whole mood of the thing. Because yeah. it's all like that, just kind of loads of wides and just people moving across frames and mm. kind of minimal, slow dialogue, hardly any music. Mm. Um, but it kind of drags you in. You, yeah. You're still along for the ride. And you mentioned dialogue. I think the dialogue was very seemed authentic to me. Oh, not not as much as... Have you seen The Witch? No. Um, you got to check that out. It's, they did this thing where they were really going for like the linguistics of that age. And I felt that, that it was believable as well. I, I, I really thought Kurt Russell was, you know, I mean, obviously he's an amazing actor, but I, there was authenticity to the language and the way they were talking about it. And then there was humor as well, which I, I think it was beautifully written. I, yeah, you know? it is, it is, yeah. And, and it's a great ensemble cast as well. Mm. And they're all really distinct characters. Yeah, and, you, yeah. know, some, you know, I've never been particularly impressed by Matthew Fox. You know, no offence to him. Mm. I've never been particularly impressed he's, by him. He's, pro he's probably one of my favourite characters in this. He's great, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, I, I was just sort of like, is that, is that the lost guy? Because he's kind of right. good in this. Yeah. Um, you know, not that I've ever acted, but um, yeah, he was, he was a real standout. Kurt Russell as well, I think, people of a certain age and generation. And, and Kurt's having his comeback, which we're all enjoying immensely, nice. you know. So I think between this and, man, Fuck hate for late. Like this is where I was at. This yeah, is my yeah. Kurt and they Russell. Came out the same year, right? Yeah. That's crazy. Mm. I was very disappointed by hate for late. We really. Yeah. Yeah. It it is essentially a play, isn't it? And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. But I I just sort of wonder what business it has being on film. Did it feel like a western like this did? Not really. No. No. I did on a sidebar that. I, <laughs> let's not go too deeply. Right. Um, but uh, Ennio Morricone, who he did music for mm. Hateful Eight, and it does reference the thing a little bit with its snow stuff and in terms of its music, mm. called Tarantino a cretin. Oh. <laughs> it's someone he worked with. Wow. And it's kind of like, well, you are you. You can say yeah. that, really. What's Tarantino going to do about it? He just straight up, he said he's a cretin. He just points at things. And he doesn't understand them. And I was just wow. kind of like, <laughs> that's okay. uh, what a ringing, ringing endorsement yeah. <laughs> called a cretin by someone who's probably one of your heroes. Yeah. Um, I think the the thing is with this, yeah, it, it plays it plays a kind of straight die up until a point, and even when it's kind of like okay, there's this, even the the you know because there's obviously just a representation of your straight up kind of Native American, you know, person culture. Mm. And he's the one who kind of goes like, look, they're nothing to do with us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? It's funny because I had written my notes exactly this point because the danger here is, is especially that they're, this, these cannibals are so savage and so mm. brutal, especially the way they treat women, which is just absolutely, I, I, you know, depths of depravity uh, I didn't expect. And I'm so glad that there was that clever nod at the beginning. And even the, the Native American, he's called the professor. 
Yeah. So you can't accuse it of being racist. It gets out in front yeah. of that. And I'm, I was thankful of that because otherwise I don't know if I could endure something that's just... Because then it becomes almost uh, back to like cannibal ferox territory where it's just really insulting. It, it toes that line because it is doing that. Yeah. But in this kind of weirdly classy way. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort yeah, of like, yeah, yeah. oh, you could give this an Ox Oscar. Yeah. Um, even if it does have a man being cleaved in half I by the, the groin. The, 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 the correct term that I had to look this up is bisected. Bisected, of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So bisected via the genitals. Yes. The unconventional Charming. way that down down south. Yeah. Uh, and that effect, I mean, that's when I say like upsetting, that effect is just like, holy shit. And then they breed by... Amputate, it's, they, it's like a boxing Helena situation, yeah. right? They've kind of amputated the women's yeah. legs and they use them as baby farms. Yes, it's not. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that's what I mean because it kind of feels like, you know, it, it feels like up to a point it would be this thing that kind of gets a bunch of Oscar attention and it's this thoughtful Western, and it is. Yeah. But then it just goes full cannibal ferox. So, I mean, it, it goes full horror. Mm. And that the kind of genres that I sort of feel like everybody expects you to like all the time that I really don't mm. are kind of war movies, uh, gangster and crime stuff doesn't do anything for me, and generally westerns, mm. not really my cup of tea. I, I've clearly, I, you know, I appreciate them, I'm mm. not mental, but um, I think a big part of this for me was the fact that it is, it, it's a conventional horror film in disguise, mm. and it keeps that close to its chest until mm. the very end. Yeah. And, and I can't keep saying this enough, that last act is just horrific. Mm. Um, Cellbook 99 pulls a similar does thing. it? Mm. I haven't seen it so uh, yeah. Mm. Mm. But can I say something before, as we're talking about the violence? I think what what, and I was discussing this with my wife because I, I, I have, luckily I'm blessed with somebody that uh, likes to watch horribly violent things with me. Um, but what, and I asked her, what was it that, what is it that is disturbing about the violence? And it's the portrayal of violence, it's it's clumsy. It's um, Obviously, it's choreographed, but it's not. It's there's an authenticity again to the, and this word keeps cropping up, but it's done in a clumsy way that's very believable, and it's not slick. There's a there's a um, I think it's kind of the mundanity of evil in a mm. way done differently because you know that's something that's often said about the Nazis and stuff like that because they you know they love to spreadsheet and you know mm. the, I don't want to I'm not make any jokes about that but like the in Bone Tomahawk it's because that those people that's just how they live that's, that, yeah. so that's it, what they do it's so it's when they kind of cleave that guy in half yeah. their face is you know there's no and the guy is trying to oh god he's trying to figure out um he's trying to figure out like a win is it winchester rifle yeah how it works and he's got it pointed at kurt russell's genitals yeah. and like he pulls the click and kurt's like ha and then he kind of goes and it's yeah. <laughs> this, this horribly tense yeah. scene and it's got um you know really nice stuff about the flea circus and stuff like that and i didn't catch that I, when, yeah that's um i can't remember was that in name. the dialogue when they were in the, when they're in the, the cages right, yeah because right, 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 right. they're kind of like they're saying to him they're trying to comfort him and tell him that I help's coming that. and stuff and it's all through the kind of metaphor of the flea circus yeah. and, who, but then, who, do you know who wrote it he wrote it he wrote it do, man's a machine i don't know what i feel i think because like i say he came out of nowhere yeah two theories Parallel dimension or time machine. <laughs> that's, right. that's all I got. Because yeah. just to come out, I mean, okay, so he was he was a prolific novelist, so you know, and wow, a musician. Yeah. He's, you he's know. obviously, you know, so honed he, his craft. Yeah, yeah, he didn't come out of nowhere, nowhere, yeah. but he came, you know, yeah. disappeared fully formed, which I found really interesting. I mean, going back to there is something I've seen kind of emerging in in his work that might be quite troubling to some, is that so. For, so, for example, in uh, Cell Block 99, uh -huh. it's a minor spoiler for Cell Block 99. Okay. It's not a thing I really expected to say out loud today, but one of the characters is kind of like a almost comedy torture abortionist. Right. <laughs> yeah, nice. so like the idea is like he's gonna, um, spoilers for that film, they have his pregnant wife kidnapped and he's apparently such a skilled abortionist that he can go in and remove the child's arms and legs and it will be born alive oh as a quadruple God. amputee. And it's like... He loves amputation, doesn't he? What are you trying to say, mate? Oh, <laughs> like, what does this mean? And I know people are already, you know, I'm not going to throw into this until I've seen it, but 
dragged across concrete, the new one, people are saying it's a bit skirting a line as well. It's got Mel Gibson in it. Mm. And it seems that might be a touch, kind of touchy on the slightly racialist mm. type, racialist, that's a word, type type thing. Uh, I haven't seen it. You know, I've seen some write-ups. I don't right. want to go there, particularly not on YouTube. I'm very fuck intrigued that. now. I, I, I'm that, strangely, that intrigues me more. Mm. Uh, I want to see it like crazy. Yeah. Like I really, and, and based on, again, I wasn't as mad about Cyberpunk 99, but it pulls similar tricks and, it, and it's that just kind of stillness mm. and it's kind of, um, just the way things kind of ex explodes with violence when, yeah. it's, when it needs to be. And it is really about the craft of violence and yeah. how you deploy uh, it, it. It reminded me a little bit actually talking about violence, the history of violence, kind of there's a this slightly Kroberian, I don't know, that's, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. word there, uh, feel to it. Um, but actually, I, I did want to ask you one question, is that, uh, is there anything that you had issues, any issues you had with it? Not really. No. I mean, the thing is, you could you could go at it from an angle of saying like, well, this is a negative portrayal of Native Americans, mm. but not only do they get out in front of that, I think, with the character of the professor, mm. but also I just think it's so outlandish that they might as well be aliens or something. I mean, yeah. this is not portraying any real people. And yeah. the thing you've like, the, Bone voice box because yeah. that's the thing you need to get with this film it, it, it's bag of tricks is that it's deceiving you right and it's it comes at you as this kind of like high art modern western yes. when actually it's yes. a it's a oh, what kind of high concept gross out horror, horror film, handled yeah. like it was a kind of yeah. Oscar bait Western film. Yeah. So even when all the horrible stuff's going off, it's still got that stillness and that minimalism. Mm. And it, it the, you know, the kind of long takes and kind of quiet edits and transitions and, and the use of time in this film, because you, you're often reminded of how long it's been, how long it's going to take to trek to the place mm. and how long it's taken them. And it's very good at checking whether the water and food supply is and stuff like that. You mm. know, it felt a little bit like I was playing a game sometimes. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I, but I really appreciated that patience because the payoff is there, surprisingly with horrific violence, but the, the, there was also time to develop the characters. And um, I, I've seen your, your, your uh, videos that uh, often with modern cinema, the criticism is that they haven't developed the characters. And, they all, even though they were archetypes, they felt very well formed, and they they had their own um, strong identities. Even the um, uh, what's his name? I have to forget uh, the fox guy. What's he called? Oh, Matthew Fox. Matthew yeah, Matthew Fox. Sorry. Um, like there was a, a sense of mystery about his character, but I liked that because it, you know where did he come from? Nobody in the in the town. And the town, incidentally, is called Bright Hope, right? Mm. Which is just completely at odds. It's, it's like this... abs and this is the thing. At the start of the film, it's called Bright Hope because you don't know what's yeah. at the other end. So <laughs> yeah. it's like, ah, oh, it's a kind of westerny name. Yeah. And then, like, okay, they go to the cave of dark despair, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. It's like the inverse. <laughs> yeah. So, like, yeah, it's when you, this is the, this is what I like about it. It's when I finished it, I was kind of like, ah, oh, I just can't stop thinking about it. I was like, oh yeah, you man. want to be in that world, even though it's so because it pops all these things in without yeah. telling you, and yeah. you, and you come back to it. But anyway, just to, to um, digress, yeah, the characters, mm. okay, yeah, they're kind of archetypal, and I think when you do that, you skirt a bit close to having cartoons or ciphers, mm. but because it uses its runtime effectively. Yeah, you get a real sense of who they are, and, and sometimes it's visual. You know the way they carry absolutely, themselves, absolutely. and like the thing with the broken leg, and the way they behave, and stuff oh, like that. Fitting, yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't even. <laughs> I think when I watched it back, I didn't even wince. I right. should have probably thought about that a bit more. Um, you know, the, and this is I've complained time and time again about runtime because, okay, do I need a two-hour forty-five-minute Transformer film? Yeah. No. What have I learned about Optimus fucking Prime in the fifth Transformer film that's two and a half hours? Mm. I've learned so much more about each of these ensemble of characters in two hours ten. Right. Because Transformers that doesn't that? need to be that long. It's 130 minutes. 132, right, right. Yeah. 132, so two, kind of two hours ten. It's just done so deftly. And I think a lot of blockbuster stuff just does it for the sake of it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I did... <laughs> This is a complete opposite of Bumblebee, but I am um, I just, uh, Bumblebee of both Tomahawk. I just watched Bumblebee. Right. Because okay. uh, I've been going to the cinema in the mum taxi. Cause, Bumblebee cause Tomahawk, that would be an interesting one. <laughs> this is really kind of quite sweet, but then it's all butchery and shit. <laughs> yeah. Though um, in Bumblebee, spoilers for Bumblebee, yeah. uh, a, a robot is cleft in twain. Right. It's a bisected robot. Interesting. Both shot in California. 
Paramount Ranch, Paramount is the link between... I'm yeah. basically saying that Bumblebee's a remake of Bone Tomahawk. I'm not saying that at all, that's a really <laughs> stupid thing to say. Um, but that, you know, that is newer Transformers film, they did it in two hours and it had loads of great kind of character mm. stuff in it. And mm. I'm not saying you can't do that, I just think a lot of modern blockbusters seem to be long for the sake of it. Right. Whereas this, two hours kind of 12... I wouldn't take, there's nothing I could take out of it. No. I mean, and I think yeah. it all plays into the mood. I, I only have one person, personally one criticism, and I, I was discussing this with my wife, because the, 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 the way women are portrayed in the film, uh, the damsel in distress, the, the, the assistant doctor, I forget her name, it's, uh, she's, she's a beautiful woman, uh, Lily Simmons, Simons perhaps. Um, but, and also the women in the cave that are, yeah, human incubators basically, um, and I, I, my wife said, is that a sign of the times that obviously women, the role of women in that era, or um, was there a possibility to, to develop that character a little bit? Maybe it was a missed opportunity. Um, I, I don't know. How do you feel about it? No, I know what you mean. Um, and it does feel because it, particularly since when uh, Patrick Wilson's wife has gone, that's yeah. just it. To the yeah. film. she's gone. And um, I don't know. I, I wonder if he's got an eye on those kind of male-driven films, and that's what it is. Because mm. you know, we just talked about the thing around these parts recently, and that's just all guys, right? You know. And I know what you mean. It does kind of feel a bit weak. And I think in Cell Block '99, maybe he course corrects that a bit because the portrayal of the kidnapped wife is a lot more sympathetic ah, to her. Interesting. She's portrayed as being quite cool and on it and right. stuff like that. You know. Um, I think certain things like the kind of the human incubator thing. I think it's just been done to create a horrific situation. Right. You know, it's just done to create something nasty. Yeah. And it's something like I don't feel because I not I don't really enjoy kind of torture porny stuff. You know, like your hostels and stuff mm. like that. Those um, the hostel films incidentally had work by Greg Nicotero and Howard Berger and, and like the stuff like when a man's willy's cut off and fed to a dog, it looks really real. Mm didn't see the point of it and it's just unpleasant to watch but it's fantastic effects work yeah. but it serves no purpose yeah. and they dwell on it so it's like oh I always wondered what a teenage girl getting drilled in the head looked like and yeah. it doesn't serve any plot it's just kind of like these vignettes of horrible stuff whereas this it do, it's horrible but it doesn't dwell particularly and it's a, the, the big agree. shock is the bisection scene I agree yeah. but it's done in a way that I mean it's horrible but it's not glam. I think those kind of torch points film kind of glamorized that. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. I, I think that's what also going back to what I said earlier about uh, the, the, the violence is. It's awkward. It's clumsy. It's it's gritty, and and that's what ultimately makes it disturbing. It's matter of fact, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what's disturbing um, because I'm not disturbed by the hostels. It's it's so far fetched. It's boring. Yeah. It's and so... I, you know, my father was a surgeon. I used to go uh, when I was a kid. I used to sneak into a study and I looked at all these colour photographs of horrific accidents. <laughs> so I know what the real thing looks like and, and it's, it's, it's so glossy. Yeah. This doesn't have any of that glossiness. There's, there's dirt, you can almost feel it. And it and it's, it's part of partially the way it's covered. You know, I think the bisexual thing is kind of holds the shot for a hell of a lot, like too long. That's the thing. It's mm. like, I don't want to watch it, but it's there. Mm. But when they do it and it's kind of like got cool music and edits yeah, yeah. and stuff, and it's like, well, you're just glamorising someone having a bloody power drill shoved up there. Because oh, so yeah. that's what the, the hostels are. Eli Roth might as well just come out and, get, and list, okay, here's the horrible things you're going to see. Firstly, someone's going to get a mm. fork in the eye. And that's all they are. And it's like, oh, someone escapes the hostel. Interesting. I saw his uh, Green Inferno before, just before seeing this. And it, it didn't do anything for me, but it, it, I guess we were going for a cannibal. I don't know. My wife. Cannibal Christmas. Yeah, cannibal Christmas. <laughs> cannibal Christmas. Um, but yeah, the, the, it, it didn't, it just didn't do anything. Mm. You know, I may, I, maybe I've become desensitized, I don't know, but um, yeah, it just didn't have it. Yeah, there is that. Kind of, sometimes when I'm watching this just stuff, just like plain face, it's like, mm. maybe I'm a psychopath. Maybe this, <laughs> maybe this is the one that tips me over. I've, I've totally yeah. just gone off the reservation, you know yeah. what I mean? But then again, you know, this is, I like my horror films and I've always yeah. kind of been onto that. But even this and Cellbook 99, there are moments of just kind of like, yeah, that is, that's nasty. Right. That's unpleasant. Right. You know, upsetting. I'm intrigued. I want to see it now. Yeah, yeah go check it out. Like, oh, definitely. And, oh, then, yeah. and then, you know, Drag Cross Concrete is going to come out as well. And I'm interested to see what that's all about. That's kind of a buddy, <laughs> it's like an evil, but I just assume everything he does is evil. I mean, this is like this kind of death metal guy. It's like a buddy right. cop film. 
Right, so okay. maybe it's kind of like a curb stomp in lethal weapon, like fuck nice. knows, I don't know. Nice. I suppose, oh actually, yeah, it's a kind of cop team up film with Mel Gibson. Wow, okay. Well, well. I'm intrigued now. Intrigued. Yeah, well, you know, I this is it. I, I really, really like this film. It was came on Netflix. Someone said, hey, you've got to watch it. Mm. And I just sat and watched it in absolute silence. Like, I was completely uh, captivated by it. You know, just fully into it. I loved every moment of it. And I really liked the kind of the turn it made at the end. And it just became this kind of essentially grindhouse B-movie horror, but through this kind of really high art lens. Mm. It was really refreshing to see, because I think a lot of people who work in that mode are afraid to do that kind of stuff. Mm. But then again, also, kind of like how loads of kids from the 50s came of age in the 80s, which is why, like, Joe Dante, Zemeckis, all these films, like, all, all, like Barry's Not Included, all that kind of uh, ambulance stuff, all had 50s shit in it. Like, so Gremlins got this 50s right, stuff and Barry's right. in it. And now all the kind of, like, uh, grimy, awful trolls that watched all the nasty, fucked up horror in the 70s mm. and 80s have come of age, and now they're injecting that into mainstream cinema. Yeah. Which has been going on for some time, like, I, you know, because this is what Eli Roth built a career on, really, and Tarantino and people like that. Mm. And for someone to come out into this new wave, I mean, and again, Tarantino and um, Rodriguez try to build something off the back of the kind of grindhouse thing, mm. which to my view works to various degrees of, su degrees of success. I thought um, Death Proof was a fucking awful film. Like, I, I just, I thought it was boring and ugly mm. and pointless. I, I thought it was just an excuse to see girls' feet. That is all of Tarantino's films. Yeah, I, I'm, t I'm a little bit tired of that. Well, yeah, if you kind of look back at his back catalogue, there's a whole lot of foot perfumes. Yeah, there is. Mm. Yeah. Well, they, they, well, this is it. For someone else to... This is someone essentially doing the same thing better, in my view. And yeah. for, for this to come out essentially opposite uh, the Hateful Eight. Yeah. And be a far how better fun, film, in my funny. view. Do you, uh, there's a part of me that, even though and we mentioned this, that the depravity of this world I kind of, and you said it's a bit like a game, I kind of want to go back to it. I want to see those characters have another adventure. Mm. You know, maybe not this time not cannibal Indians, but I don't know, but do, you know, bank robbers. Cannibal Eskimos. <laughs> cannibal Eskimos, okay. Uh, yeah, and then it could be in the snow, like the thing. Um, no, but I genuinely, I want, to, I want to see more of them, and I haven't felt that, that, that way about characters in a long time. Yeah, it's nice to sort of feel like you want to go back to that world. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm always... Even though it's a horrible, horrible, horrible Well, this world. is the thing, you sort of like, uh, you want to go, uh, you, you see them go through that, and you just want to go like, oh, yeah. have a break. Yeah, have I just, a cup of tea. I want to see you have a, yeah, have, some, <laughs> have a sit down and some sweet tea, yeah. and you yeah. feel a lot better, and go back. I yeah. go back to the town, tell Kurt Russell his missus is dead, yeah. uh, tell missus that he's dead, and then uh, have some tea and a slice of cake. Yeah. I'll, have, I'll watch that for two hours just to know that they're all right. It's yeah. just such a horrible... Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, well, I would say the next film in the, you know in his series has fewer concessions to such things. Mm. So I, and from what I understand, I think they're increasingly bleak. This is just from what I understand of uh, Dragged Across Concrete, but mm. and just the name, Dragged Across Concrete. Um, Tells you everything you need to know, really. Yeah. So I don't know if it, because 99 is fucking bleak and, and its palette is grey, because mm. this is kind of sandy yeah. blue or teal and orange or whatever, you know, mm. it's kind of westerny colour palette. Like, so 99 is grey. It's either like sterile kind of greens and blues or it's grey. Right. Well, uh, we are nearly out of time. Um, Duncan Casey has just waved his his hand at me to say that the time is up. So it's been very good to have you, sir. Um, so to man. end so abruptly. Um, I hope you enjoyed. We'll be back next time with another thing. I might be in it. I might not be in it. I, I don't know what we're going to release next. I just kind of edit things randomly now. <laughs> Whatever I feel like. Yeah. We'll get well, man. Yeah, cheers, man. I'll be, uh, I'll be limping around, getting things done. Don't worry about it. All right, we'll be back. Tune in next week for more stuff. 3 p.m. every Monday. It Ain't Broke on Valverde Broadcasting. Goodbye. Support your 7th or 8th favourite YouTube channel by buying crap, tat, junk, hogwash and filth at redbubble.com slash people slash Valverde shop.